Hello class, I'm Dr. Yang and welcome to CS370 Operating Systems. Chapter 4, Threads Implementation. Alright, before we start, let's quickly check where we are right now. Uh, we are now back to Chapter 4 and we are going to study the second half of the Chapter 4. So we planned that we are going to come back to Chapter 4 to talk about the second half, uh, which is basically implementation. Uh, after this, we're going to study the second half of the uh, chapter five, and then we're going to uh, move on to chapter six, which is mostly about deadlock, and then chapter seven, uh, which is about CPU scheduling. All right, so this is part two of the textbook. And then after this, uh, we are going to move on to part three, which is about memory management. And before we move on, I should emphasize that this is the most important part. Now, if you ask me to pick the single most important part of these operating system class, I would say that the ability to write code using condition variable and mutexes. Let's move on. Jesus nut shown here is a mechanical component of a helicopter. It's a part of the helicopter rotor. It's not actually nut, uh, it's actually a pin. It's a literally a linchpin. So this is the part that holds every part together. Okay. Over here, you can see the basic architecture of helicopter rotor. Uh, the reason I begin this lecture with this somewhat tangential stuff is to motivate what we are going to learn today. All right. So uh, many real-world problems actually hinges on developing a key piece. Okay. So you have to come up with engineering breakthrough to solve certain problem. So let's talk a little bit about helicopter. The big idea of helicopter is it's easy, okay? So anybody can think of the idea of helicopter. Basically, the idea is you have some kind of a vessel, like a vestibule, where people can hop in, and you stick in this propeller, like a fan, and you rotate this fan fast enough, and uh, you will have big enough lift, then you get to fly, okay? This is the big idea. It's pretty simple. Uh, the thing is, if you're going to actually spend like 30 seconds actually trying to implement this big idea, then you will soon realize it's not that simple. The reason is, what you want to achieve here is not just creating a big enough lift. That's relatively easy. The problem is to control this helicopter thing. Basically, uh, what you want to achieve here is you want to go up and down. And also, you want to move forward, backwards, and also sideways. And how do you control this? So basically, you have to do something with this rotor. Okay? Uh, maybe we can solve this by changing the speed of the rotation, thereby changing the amount of lift. But... Uh, how do you implement this sideway motions? Uh, maybe you can tilt this axis, but the tilting this axis may not solve the problem. If you tilt this axis, this vessel, this vestibule may just wobble here. So apparently you need to come up with a solid engineering solution to this. So most engineering problems are like this. It's easy to uh, come up with a big idea, but it takes some uh, efforts, some kind of uh, engineering ingenuity. All right, so the solution here is, in case of this helicopter, uh, solution is given here. Now, this is a helicopter rotor. So basically, you have this rotor mast. So on the bottom, you have a big engine, and this is rotating. And you have this uh, rotor blade. So, so this is the wings, helicopter wings, that generates lift. And... 
the critical component here is this thing called the swash plate. Uh, this Lua swash plate is attached to the body of the helicopter and it doesn't move. And you have this ball bearing and the top parts moves along with a rotor and wings. And you tilt this swash plate. And you can control this by this connecting control rod. You should be able to change the angle of attack of this rotor blade. And that's how you generate different lift depending on the position. You know, you can generate more lift at the backside of the helicopter than you, uh, you're pulling forward. All right, so this is sort of the engineering, you know, ingenuity that's needed to achieve this big idea. And you have uh, this piece of critical components. It's a literally a linchpin uh, that holds everything together. And this is known as a Jesus nut for obvious reason. So engineering solution is to swash plate and the component known as Jesus nut. So uh, if you ask me, what is the critical components of helicopter? I should say it's a swash plate and Jesus nut. And you may sometimes be able to identify Jesus nut equivalent on many engineering solutions. So let's think about operating system. You know, the idea of uh, multi-threading, uh, let's assume that there is a, just one CPU, one core. Physically, there is a single core, so the, the hardware can only execute one instruction at a time, at any given time. But we want to achieve the idea of multi-threading. We want to be able to execute multiple threads simultaneously. So this is a big idea of operating system. And how? It's so always so how. How do you achieve this? And you may already know the answer. So basically, you timeshare. So you split these threads. Okay, You spend a little bit of CPU time to execute this amount of code. And you move on to different thread. And then you execute this amount of code. And you basically, you timeshare the CPU. And if you time slice the CPU fine enough, then you can create this illusion of concurrent execution of multiple threads and multiple processes. OK. so. Our solution is to timeshare, timeshare the CPU. But we still have some questions about this. The question is how? How do we timeshare? So essentially, at one point, this thread, somehow you need to make switch. And essentially, you need to come up with a scheme where you stop being yourself and start being somebody else. Uh, the answer here is technical sequence of code uh, known as context switch. Context switch refers to the mechanism that allows one thread start executing somebody else's code. Not just code, it has to switch entire world. And this is a very technical piece of code. It's almost always written in assembly languages. And this context switch, without this, we cannot implement this time sharing idea here. All right, so you may ask, how about if you have multiple cores or multiple CPUs? Okay, so in this case, our physical reality is that multiple threads can execute physically concurrently. And this is a true picture of uh, most multiprocessor or multi core systems. But the question here is, we want to synchronize these threads, OK? So we want to be able to implement the mutexes and condition variables and semaphores that's used to solve most concurrency problems. And that's a problem. There's a big problem because the concurrency here comes from the physical nature of how computers are built. And somehow you want to be able to break tie and you want to be able to call reliably that certain thread wins. And how do we achieve that? And I'll give you a little bit of a preview of chapter five. Uh, the answer here is the hardware needs to provide a solution. 
Okay, it's known as atomic instruction. The hardware has to spend some, you know, additional hardware to provide certain instructions, special instructions to be used by the software, just to be able to break the tie. And out of atomic instruction, you build, for example, spin lock, and eventually you will be able to implement mutexes and condition variables and semaphores and so on. So these are the context switch and atomic instructions. These are Jesus nuts of thread scheduling and synchronization. Okay, thread data structures. Uh, over here, you have TCB structures. Uh, in this example, we have two threads, thread one and thread two and thread states includes this object known as thread control block, TCB. And TCB has this uh, thread metadata and save register and stack information. And also stack is per thread. So uh, if you have uh, 100 threads in your process, then you, know, you have 100 instances of TCBs and also 100 instances of stack. And of course, all other parts of memory are shared so you have code, global variable, and heap memory. They are all shared. And uh, over here, you have a virtual address space. And codes are usually mapped to a region called text segment. And global variables and local static variable, they are mapped to data segment. Heap is mapped to heap region of memory. And you have uh, two stacks in this example, stack for thread one and stack for thread two. And this is the picture that you should have in your mind. So uh, although the stacks are private, this is how they instantiate the stack. So thread one should be using the stack for thread one, but nothing prevents thread one from accessing this region of memory. All right, so this TCB block, thread control block, you need to spend some memory to keep this information. Where does this TCB instances belong? They are part of the memory that belongs to thread managers. So in this case, if you imagine this situation as this is a kernel thread, I mean, uh, the whole implementation is uh, based on kernel threads, and this is a user part, then this is the kernel. It's inside the kernel, kernel part of the memory. And also, there should be a kernel stack too. So if your thread implementation is based on kernel and this, if you regard these shared state as the user part, this is the user stack and there should be kernel stack as well. I mentioned this earlier. When the processor switches its mode to kernel uh, as a result of interrupt, exception, or system call, and then processor changes its stack from user stack to kernel stack. All right, uh, going back to this uh, TCB. So uh, it is quite correct to imagine that there is uh, some kind of uh, structure called a TCB somewhere in the kernel. And part of this struct, you have a thread metadata. Uh, obviously, you have to have this state. Thread changes the state in it to running and wait and ready state. They are usually encoded with integer numbers, so enum state. So this is a member that stores the encoded value of thread state. And saved register. So you have, uh, for example, UINT64RAX, RBX, something like this. You, know, you have all these members needed to store the registers. And you have uh, stack information. You should have a pointer to the top of the stack, and they can be encoded as part of this saved register. RSP, something like this. And also, uh, this whole thing, this is, the, this is a part of a process, and the process is captured as PCB. So as a part of the thread metadata, uh, you can imagine that there should be something like this, struct PCB, pointer to PCB. Uh, basically, if you create a new thread, what you need to do is to instantiate a new object of struct TCB and fill out all these uh, members, and that's part of the thread creation.